Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show. Here are the real news. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you all with us. And welcome to another episode of Rise of the Right. Today, we take a look at Texas. It's a state that's emblematic of what we face, of a government that talks about liberty and freedom, the cloak of authoritarian and racist push, with draconian measures that actually chip away at our freedoms. The Governor Greg Abbott pardoned U.S. Army Sergeant Daniel Perry, who was convicted for killing Garrett Foster at a Black Lives Matter demonstration. Even after a jury hearing all the evidence, convicted him, and Abbott knew nothing about what was going on in it. Abbott said in one article that I read that, that uh, Texas has one of the strongest stand-your-ground laws of self-defense that cannot be nullified by a jury or a progressive district attorney. It's like the myth of the Old West coming to haunt us from the silver screen. And then far-right wing judge Matthew Kaczmarek of U.S. District Court in North of Texas was appointed by Trump, ruled in favor of anti-abortion groups, saying abortion medications are, are unsafe despite medical evidence to the contrary. In addition to that, voting rights are under assault. Push is being made to take political rights away from cities. But watch Texas. Watch America. This is what we're up against. This is what we have to fight. This is what we have to be aware of. We are joined today by Stephen Monticelli, who is a Texas Observer's special investigative correspondent based in Dallas. His reporting is featured in Rolling Stone, Daily Beast, here at The Real News, Dallas Observer, Dallas Weekly, and more. He's also the publisher of Protein Magazine, which is a very cool piece I've discovered. And thank you for doing that. But that uh, You can follow him on Twitter at Stephen Van Zetti. That's S-T-E-V-A-N-Z-E-T-T-I. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. And we are also joined by Andrea Grimes. She's a writer, editor, and activist living in Austin, Texas. And as she writes on her site with her husband, two cats, and a badly behaved hound dog. Sounds pretty Texas to me. Good to have you with us. She writes about Texas, politics, and reproductive justice. Her work appears in the Texas Observer and other publications. And her Twitter handle is at Andrea Grimes. You can also read her work at andreagrimes.com. So it's good to have you both with us. Thanks very much. So uh, Texas, let, let's just start with this, this pardon. Um, and Steve, uh, let's just start with you and Andrea to jump in. I just, this, it's, um, it was kind of not shocking, though outrageous. But give us a little backstory here. Sure. So uh, for those of you who are not aware of this backstory, Daniel Perry is uh, a veteran who is um, currently being uh, made into a what I would call a political figure by the governor of Texas, Governor Abbott, after he was convicted of murder for shooting uh, a protester in 2022, Garrett Foster. Uh, in Austin, Texas, during a protest for racial justice. Um, Perry uh, was found to have ran a red light, uh, drove towards the crowd of protesters and sort of into and amongst them, and uh, was then surrounded by a group of protesters, uh, including Garrett Foster, who uh, at the time was openly carrying an AK-47, which is legal in the state of Texas to do. And uh, was then shot by Daniel Perry, uh, who claimed self-defense. Uh, there are a number of really interesting details uh, regarding uh, Daniel Perry's state of mind and some of the things that he had texted and sent via social media messages to friends, uh, suggesting that he wanted to, quote unquote, kill or shoot uh, a, what he viewed as rioters, um, which uh, played a central piece in terms of his conviction, um, he is now, um, through his lawyers, they are arguing that uh, the trial was uh, conducted improperly. Uh, they are claiming that the jury acted inappropriately, and they are also claiming that certain evidence was withheld from the, the trial. Um, all of that is still up in the air, but what is certainly unusual about all of this is that before he was even sentenced, uh, Governor Abbott started calling for his pardon after Tucker Carlson and other major right-wing media people also started calling for this. It's a very unusual timeline when it comes to how calls for pardons in the parole board works in Texas. Andrea? Yeah, um, I mean, the whole, the whole thing is tremendously screwed up. Um, you know, I think the thing 
that stands out to me most about this is that uh, Greg Abbott has historically been somewhat reticent um, to go really hard on these sort of far right, white supremacist, explicitly fascist talking points. When he was rising up in state politics, he was lauded as kind of like a, a right-ish, middle-of-the-road, common sense, like just appreciates the law, you know, not no firebrand, you know, just sort of a regular Jude. Um, and, you know, with the rise of Trump, uh, that has really changed with him significantly. Um, but, you know, we, he still sort of distanced himself from explicitly being like a DeSantis type, right? Um, and I think that this, um, this Perry call for, for Daniel Perry's pardon um, is, a, is a significant step um, into white supre- explicit white supremacy and explicit fascism for Abbott, um, who has historically been just a little more reluctant than other um, right-wing red state leaders to really say the quiet part out loud. But I think that that's what he's doing here. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> I've seen some folks say, you know, that it's um, hypocritical for a a law and order governor to um, contradict the legal system and to, you know, to call into question the legitimacy of the legal system. But I don't think it's hypocritical for um, Governor Abbott to call for the pardon of a man who he thinks is doing a public service by killing a Black Lives Matter protester. Um, and I think that's a really meaningful distinction. Um, and I don't think that there's any hypocrisy there at all. I think it's um, entirely ideologically consistent. So just stay here on this for just a minute before we jump into another issue around abortion rights in Texas. Um, so two things. One, for people listening across the country and across the globe, um, when we describe the demonstration that took place in Texas where Perry shot uh, and and killed Garrett. Texas is an open carry state, right? Yes. You don't have to have yeah. you don't even have, you don't have to have a license. Am I right about that? No requirements, uh, especially for carrying a long arm. You do not need to have any sort of documentation, paperwork, training, anything at all. Nothing. Just have it. So, so, so I, I, let's just explore this just for a minute, and, and just your thought, both of your thoughts on this. I mean, I mean, I used to like to shoot guns, and I'm I'm, I'm not opposed to people owning the guns and stuff. But something is happening here. This is emblematic of what we could be facing when we're moving towards when Black Lives Matter demonstrators, demonstrators um, on, on the progressive side are carrying weapons. The right wing is carrying weapons in the street. Um, you have instances like this to take place. Maybe more will take place. I'm just curious, living where you live, given the reality of what you see, give us some of your, your thoughts and analysis of what, what all this might mean, what that does mean. Um, that's a great question. So I, I've spoken to some protesters who were out that night in Austin when Garrett was shot, and they feel that Governor Abbott's push to pardon Daniel Perry sends a pretty clear message around what it means uh, in terms of how open carry and stand your ground laws interact. Um, what they suggest is that the message that's being sent is as long as you're on the right side of the ideological spectrum, you will be pardoned for this sort of action or violence. Um, And we can see a through line historically in terms of how people like Governor Abbott on the one hand promote gun rights um, to maybe even the extreme. And then on the other hand, whenever they end up being carried by maybe what they view as the wrong people, suddenly other laws come into play in terms of how these people can be dealt with. I'm thinking about the Black Panthers and the history of gun laws starting in California. Uh, So, you know, I I think it sends a couple clear messages and it it does increase um, the concern among protesters who, you know, the ones I've spoken to said people started carrying long arms because of threats of violence and because of incidents in which drivers and other people had threatened uh, people for taking to the streets for racial justice protests. So, Andrew, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as, as Steve was talking and as I was reading what was going on in Texas is I could see a moment where there could be a battle taking place in the street. Right, left, guns, black, white, Chicano-Americans, all, and, and, and I mean, 
it, it, it portends something a lot deeper and maybe more dangerous than we're considering. Um, I mean, I certainly think that uh, the fantasy of armed conflict is real um, among the right wing in particular. I mean, it is the reason we saw those folks storm the Capitol on January 6th, right? I mean, they are spoiling for a fight and they have every reason to rightfully believe um, that a fundamentally fascist white supremacist system will protect them. Um, and people like Governor Abbott are coming out and saying explicitly, yeah, we intend to do that, right? Um, you know, I think the considerations, as they almost always are for folks on the left, um, are much, much more complicated, right? Um, you know, we see with the John Brown Gun Club, the Huey P. Newton Gun Club, um, other forms of, of leftist resistance um, that even, you know, sort of approach the line of like yelling loudly can be much more dangerous than on the right wing, you know, parading around the grounds of the Capitol in Texas or otherwise, you know, with their long arms. Um, so I think that that... Um, the threat of violence, of fear, of suppression um, is effective because it is real. Um, I think we see this sort of thing with violence against abortion providers and abortion supporters. Um, you know, violence at abortion clinics is up significantly since the Dobbs ruling. Um, it is, uh, you know, we're seeing all over the country, firebombing, um, etc., and, you know, the folks who commit those sorts of crimes are charged, you know, sort of depending where they are located. Um, but we just saw in Florida, for example, um, Democratic lawmakers who were protesting a proposed six-week ban there were arrested for sitting on a sidewalk outside, you know. Um, so there's just a real um, significant disparity in the way... <laughs> American protest is treated in this country. And I think that makes sort of the, the fight in the street cal calculation uh, much more complicated for folks on the left than it does for folks on the right. I'm going to come circle back to this in terms of what comes next, but let me just leave into a minute for everybody listening to Judge Kaczmarek and, uh, and the abortion ruling that took place in Texas. Um, and I, it, it, uh, every time I talk about this, I, almost, I started losing my mind a little bit just because I was thinking, as I wrote to you all before we had the conversation, that many decades back, I was in the abortion underground uh, until 1973 and working with doctors to make sure women were safe. And now we're back in this place. Uh, and Texas is like at the, that, at the heart of what the future could be bringing to us. So, and, and that's something you've been writing a lot about, Andrea. So let, let me start with you on this one. Just, I mean, that ruling, talk about what that ruling was and how significant it is and what it does around the battle around women's right to choose. So Justice Matt Kismarek was put in his job. He was appointed to his position to do one thing and one thing only, which is carve a path for fetal personhood in the federal judiciary. Um, his background... Um, coming from right-wing legal thought, groomed in the Federalist Society. Um, really, uh, you know, Trump uh, did this with intention, um, and uh, Kismarek is in the U.S. Northern District Court of Texas to pave this path. And uh, the anti-abortion forces who uh, filed this case initially also exist solely to do this thing. So the, uh, they call themselves the Alliance for Hippocrat Hippocratic Me Medicine, and they were founded in August 2022, and they filed this suit in November 2022, and what they want is to take one part of the medication abortion regimen, mifepristone, um, off the market to make uh, mifepristone, uh, uh, to rescind its FDA approval. Now, uh, mifepristone isn't the only drug used in medication abortion. There's another medicine called misoprostol, and you can use misoprostol on its own to safely end an abortion, but MIFI uh, makes the process a lot more tolerable, more effective. 
Um, so these folks ostensibly say they are deeply concerned about the health and safety of people who take mifepristone. And they would like for the FDA to seriously reconsider its approval, which was rushed. Of course, it wasn't rushed. Um, Mifepristone was used safely in other countries before it was approved in the United States. Um, And over the past uh, 23 years since the FDA first approved Mifepristone, we have learned a lot more about how the medication works. Um, Again, very safe, very effective. Um, unfortunately, uh, because it is safe and effective, because it does what it is meant to do, which is end pregnancy, of course, the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine uh, considers it to be a drug that is 100% fatal uh, to what Judge Matt Kismark would call unborn children, um, but which, of course, are zygotes, fertilized eggs, contents of wombs, right? Um, Certainly, it is very safe for pregnant people to take and much safer um, than a number of other options um, that people might pursue in the absence of access to clinical or safe medical care. Um, So Kismark ruled last week basically saying, yeah, he thinks the FDA approval should be rescinded. He's going to give him a week to make a few more arguments in court. And then, of course, we got a ruling last night, which would have been Wednesday night from the Fifth Circuit, uh, which threw a a number of wrenches, really an entire toolbox, perhaps an entire tool shed uh, into the questions of the case. And so legal scholars are parsing all of that out this morning. The upshot is, um, at least until this Saturday, uh, providers will be able to prescribe mifepristone according to the 2000s regulations, but not with the updates made to the prescription regulations in 2016 and 2023. Sorry, that was a lot. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, from what I gather, basically, um, the initial ruling created an extreme um, sort of decree to try to remove all access. And what the fifth court has effectively done is um, said, okay, well, let's just remove some avenues for access. You can no longer get this mailed to you under their ruling. Um, so there's a number of things still to be worked out, as Andrea said, but I think it also needs to be considered in uh, the broader scope of attempts to subvert democratic rule in the state of Texas. It's just one of many attempts uh, to preempt various forms of um, democratic rulings and to try to rule effectively from the top down, wherever the top is controlled by the right people. Um, We're seeing attempts to, you know, remove DAs in uh, counties where the state government does not approve of the district attorney. Um, And so in this instance, you know, I view this as just another way to crack down on rights that have been gained um, through legitimate democratic processes. What, as, as, you were, as you both were just talking, one of the things that popped in my head that I'd like to explore with you both um, about Texas is there was an article, I think, in The Observer that I read, and I, one of you may have written, I forget, I, I apologize, but it, it, that, that looking at um, that America did not become even a, close to being a full democracy until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Movement and how that changed the course of this country, where everybody was enfranchised for the first time. And now we're seeing this major pushback. You were just saying, whether it's Mississippi or, or whether it's Texas and other areas where they're trying to take rights away from cities to govern themselves, challenging voting rights, making it more difficult for people to vote, especially people of color, to vote in, the, in, in, in Texas. So I, 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 I'd like you kind of th- both think about for a moment, talk about where you think this takes a Texas in the, in, the, in the coming months and years, what that struggle will look like inside your state, and what that says about the entire country. Well, let's just start with Texas. And again, Stephen, you know, I was thinking about the stuff you've been, write- you've been writing about that. So, I mean, where, 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 where do you all think this takes you? Uh, well, I, I think it takes us in many ways right back to the past um, where some of these folks would like us to be, where white men control everything in the state of Texas. Uh, Dallas, where I live, 
was effectively controlled by the Ku Klux Klan a hundred years ago. Yes. That just doesn't go away within a couple generations. We've got a deeply embedded set of ideologies in Texas that are white supremacist in nature. And uh, they're revealing themselves increasingly uh, through, you know, what may be viewed uh, through a certain lens as contradictions or hypocritical actions. But as Andrea has so adeptly said, if viewed through the proper ideological lens, uh, it's quite consistent in terms of just a will to power for people who want to control the lives of others uh, and get back to the days of the good old boys club. Um, I really don't see any other way of making sense of the efforts to crack down on LGBTQ people, uh, to remove district attorneys in urban areas where they don't like, even proposing laws to be able to overturn elections in major counties like Houston and Dallas, where the Republican right wing certainly does not have a stronghold. Um, so I think we're going to increasingly see conflicts between the state level and, and local levels uh, in this direction. It's very critical what you're talking about here. And Andrea, please jump in here. I mean, I think you know, one of the things, as I look at places like Texas, and I know Texas, I've been now there a lot over the years, a lot of friends there, is that we all need to pay attention to what's happening in Texas because, as I said earlier in the opening, it's emblematic of what could be happening in the entire country, what we can be facing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the the fact, the I mean, the the unfunny joke we often make here is that the you know the motto of the University of Texas is "What starts here changes the world," and unfortunately, <laughs> that is true <laughs> about right wing <laughs> politics um, in Texas and the influence, the out outsized influence that Texas politics has um, on the rest of the country, and it is why um, I whenever possible and whenever I hear it, I speak out against folks who think they live in safer geographies, who say, why doesn't Texas just secede? Why don't people just leave Texas? Why don't you all just move, right? Um, of course, we can't for a number of reasons. Our people are here. Our families are here. Our jobs are here. It's very expensive to move. Maybe we don't want to. Maybe we shouldn't have to, right? Right, right. Um, and the truth is that, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, bad ideas that are workshopped and executed here in Texas um, end up elsewhere, and it doesn't take long. There are not many places in the United States where clinical abortion care is truly, genuinely accessible. Um, abortion is heavily, heavily re regulated across the U.S., even in states uh, that would consider themselves abortion havens. I mean, we're really talking about like Oregon and Washington State are the two places you can genuinely walk into a clinic and get an abortion on demand, right? Um, so, you know, I think when people... Um, you know, or, or sort of uh, dismiss Texas or the South or the Midwest as being these like essentially hostile or uniquely difficult geographies, um, you know, you have to realize we are voter suppressed here. We are voter suppressed in most of the country. Um, you know, we are uh, disenfranchised on a number of other levels. Um, you know, <laughs> women and folks of color here understand that our government hates us. Um, and that doesn't mean that we don't fight, that we don't, um, you know, resist. Uh, but it does mean that uh, doing the work is pretty difficult. And, um, you know, I think what folks in Texas need and the South and Midwest need is support, right? Um, you know, I think we need money coming into our grassroots organizations, especially, especially money coming into our small presses, into our independent presses and alternative media, so that these stories that don't get told in the mainstream uh, and legacy publications do get told somewhere, right? Um, so, you know, when I think about what is the future for Texas or for the nation, um, you know, I I would love to imagine that... Uh, abortion bans, for example, are going to suddenly cause a whole load of privileged white women to rise up and start voting in a way they have never voted. 
Um, I am not super optimistic about that. I am even less optimistic about white (laughs) men doing so, even if they claim to love women and their wives and their daughters and their mothers. Um, you know, so it's, it's a real, it's a real, real battle. Um, I, you know, it's, I, I hate to say it. I don't know how much worse it will have to be here for the tide to swing in the other direction. I don't think that that is impossible. However, I, I remain cautiously optimistic that future change is possible, but it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take an awful lot of support from people outside of Texas with resources funneling them here instead of writing us off and considering themselves safe and immune to what we're seeing going on here. So I'd like you both kind of explore for a moment what, what you think the, the resistance and the political movements are in Texas that kind of battle this. And I know life is more complex than Republicans and Democrats. Fine. But in the last election, let's just say, when you look at the last election uh, in Texas, um, it was what, like a, a 54-46 split, something like that, for the, in the presidential election, um, which to me is kind of paints a picture of, of how divided the state is. But if you look at what Texas, what Texas is doing just in terms of uh, trying to destroy minority majority districts and, and playing this ele- election integrity game, and all their Orwellian doublespeak that they do, but they're, they're really building a power. So the question is, I'm, I'm curious, your reflections on what you see around you in terms of organizations and resistance to that, and what form you think that'll take. How do you see that future battle looming inside of Texas? There's a number of groups. It, it would be difficult to do justice to them all. In no, no, a I wouldn't. Short yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I, yeah. but um, you know, there are there are fantastic groups doing uh, really important work on the ground. There's a number of abortion funds. For example, Lilith Abortion Fund um, that are still collecting women uh, resources for women and um, you know helping them get directed to the access that they need. Um, there's been attempts to try and shut those down or you know scuttle their operations, but as of today, it's one of the most you know an- analogous things to the underground um, that you used to be a participant in. Um, there's also you know groups like the Texas Organizing Project and others that are doing a, a variety of types of work. Um, you know, I think we're going to really need to lean into supporting um, labor groups in the state, even though, you know, we are not so friendly to unions uh, in terms of our state policy. Um, there are significant um, gains in terms of, you know, they may be small, but to have a Starbucks that's unionized not too far from my house, that wouldn't have been something that I would have imagined. Um, not long ago. So I, I think it's going to be, you know, a, a coalescence of um, a lot of groups on the ground, groups like uh, the AFIA Center in Dallas, which is one of the only black women led um, reproductive health organizations. Did you, that say, did you say AFIA? Uh, AFIA, A-F-I-Y-A. AFIA, gotcha, I'm sorry. Gotcha. I believe. Yeah. And they're, they're really fantastic. Um, you know, I, I think, as Andrea said, supporting these groups that are already on the ground, that are doing this work, that are deeply embedded in communities is essential to, you know, the organization of a countervailing force against this sort of oppressive right wing movement that we're seeing. Um, and we're also going to, you know, see other um, groups as Andrea also mentioned groups like the Elm Fork John Brown Gun Club, which have, you know, emerged as a response to fascistic threats of violence and harassment to the LGBTQ community in Texas. Um, you know, I, I think people need to really understand that this state is far more, as you mentioned, you know, maybe divided or diverse yes. than people give it credit for. It's one of the most diverse states, just demographically. Um and so I think uh, making sure that we don't forget that and write it off just because the loudest donkeys that bray and get all this attention <laughs> seem like really bad people, um, they can be overcome, but it also does require a very nuanced understanding of how we got here, what does gerrymandering look like, um, and what sort of resources will we need, you know, we need to bring to bear to actually make change happen because it's possible. And if it, if it happens, uh, another saying that's popular, as goes Texas, 
so goes the nation. And if Texas were to change politically, if one major county like, say, Tarrant County were to have a shift, suddenly dominoes start falling in a big way. And I think it's important to, 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 to kind of end our conversation on these notes because people have a tendency to always go, oh, woe is me. The sky is falling. We're done. But we're not done. <laughs> and what you're describing is how it, Texas is still at play. And there's a lot going on there beyond watching what Abbott does and what these right-wing judges do. You know, I think that's really important to, to, uh, to, for us to kind of conclude on. And Andrew, do you want to give us a closing thought on that? Yeah, sure. Um, a, a thing that strikes me about all of this is that the faults that I see doing the strongest, most consistent leadership um, and resistance against um, right-wing forces in Texas are people who are most under threat by those forces. Uh, a, a great example is the Buckle Bunnies Fund, which is an abortion fund out of San Antonio led by women of color um, and disabled women. And they never stopped funding abortion when all of the other Texas state abortion funds did because they said, we don't care if the court says boo, we're going to keep doing this work, right? So, you know, it's, um, you know, I think the sort of the big names that we all hear, the Planned Parenthoods, the Texas Democratic Party, I think those organizations are fine. They do good work, but nothing wrong with them, right? Um, but the, the folks who are on the ground, um, not working for communities or at communities, but within and of their communities, right, are the are the organizations that I think are really going to be spurring in this change. Mama Sana, Vibrant Women here in Austin, uh, Susneros and Fronteros in San Antonio, um, the Frontera Fund in South Texas, right? Um, you know, if, if we're going to make change here, it will come from people who are doing it because they must for their own survival. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, finding those groups and those organizations and those leaders is the key to getting us all free. So this is, this has really been interesting. And one of the things I, I will, I'm going to call on both of you by email and more to, um, to start bringing other folks on the, the groups you talked about to start hearing those voices here at the real news, because they have to be heard. The ones who are on the ground doing, do, doing that work is really important for us to, to know what their struggles are like, what they're doing. And, and where they see the future. And I think that's because uh, um, it, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's not done. And as I said earlier, the oh, woe is me thing really gets on my nerves. I mean, <laughs> it, we don't have time for woe is me. So but I want to thank you both but for, for being with us today, uh, Steve Monticelli and Andrea, Andrea Grimes, for the work you do. I appreciate the writing and the work you all do and uh, look forward to talking to you many more times. And I'll be in touch to do more stories about Texas. Well, thank you both so much. Thanks very much. Good to have you both here. Thank you, Mark. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that conversation today with Stephen Monticelli and Andrea Grimes. We'll link to their work on our website here. You can follow up on what they're doing, and we will follow up with them and bring you more stories about Texas with people on the ground, what they're doing, because uh, it's really important to hear the voices of the people actually in the midst of all of that. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. And please let me know what you thought about what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover, what you'd like me to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com, and I'll write you right back. And while you're there, go to www.therealnews.com forward slash support, become a monthly donor, and become part of the future with us. So for David Hebden and Kelly Rivera and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.